In today's video, we're going to try to answer the question, what is a VNA? Now, of course, if you Google this, you'll find uh, various answers that'll sound something like, you know, an instrument that measures the magnitude and phase of the reflection and transmission properties of the ports of a device versus frequency. Now, what the heck does that mean, right? So let's try to break it down and make it easier to understand. A vector network analyzer is used to characterize RF devices, and that could be something as simple as a filter or an amplifier or even an antenna. It's typically done by applying a source to that device and then measuring what happens. The device under test will certainly affect the signal going through it, whether it's an amplifier or a filter or some other device like that, but uh, also the input impedance characteristics of the device will also affect what's being applied to that device. So it's really important to uh, characterize what the device does to a signal going through it and what kind of a load it presents to the source. One thing to remember, and one of the reasons we talk about this, is that you know, maximum power transfer occurs when the load impedance matches the source impedance. It's typically uh, kind of shown as you know, the load resistance and source resistance because oftentimes we try to deal with non-reactive uh, loads but in a general sense maximum power transfer will occur when the load and source have got a conjugate match. Now when we talk about RF circuits it's often handy to think of the signals as waves and talk about their magnitude and phase. Now in most RF circuit designs uh, there's typically what we call a system impedance involved, meaning that there are transmission lines or interconnects between devices, and then the, the input and output ports of the devices themselves are usually designed around this common non-reactive uh, impedance, usually 50 ohms. And as we mentioned earlier, when the source and load impedances match, then the maximum power is delivered to the load, meaning that essentially there's no power reflected off of that load's input, and all of the power is absorbed by the load. Now, of course, the device under test will alter the magnitude and phase of the signal going through it, and we call these the transmission properties of that device. We can certainly measure the input signal, and we measure the output signal, and compare them in various ways. And this is something that's very often done even in non-RF applications. You might take an oscilloscope and probe the input of a circuit and the output of it to be sure the circuit is doing what you expect. This is really no different, except that now we're typically characterizing some other properties of the signal, as well as uh, the performance of the circuit. Now, when these source and load impedances don't match, then actually some power is reflected off of the load and back towards the source. We call these the reflection properties. Now, of course, that reflection signal can be measured and also compared to the input to see what's going on. Now, this topic is something that you typically don't run into unless you're doing RF work. Because if you're just building analog circuits and you're probing the inputs and outputs, you don't really think about signal reflections. So this is something that's an, uh, a little bit uh, different and interesting to take a look at. So let's actually go to the bench and see what's going on. So here's the setup we have on the bench to kind of mimic part of what goes on in measuring the reflection properties in a VNA. I've got a signal generator here that's doing, got a 50 ohm output impedance. In this case, I'm sending it through a three-way splitter. This could also be a directional coupler, but I'm just using a splitter here because that's what I have. So what that's doing is sending that signal to the scope as essentially a sample of the input signal that we're going to use to compare against other signals. And then a, that signal is also sent to a directional coupler. Uh, out of that directional coupler is going into our device under test, and I'll put a couple of different loads there. Now this directional coupler that I'm using I've actually hooked up essentially backwards, meaning that the input of the coupler is down here. So what that means is that any signal that gets reflected off of this port will get coupled uh, into the coupled port and up to channel two. And if the signal is going through in this direction effectively doesn't get coupled much at all to that port. Okay, so this allows us to measure the signal coming back off of the device under test when the impedances don't match. And of course, then the output of the DUT is going into channel 3, in case we want to take a look at that. Now, this directional coupler, if you uh, are unfamiliar with them, I did a video on them a while back, and I'll link that uh, down below so you can take a little bit of a deeper dive into what a directional coupler actually does. Yeah, so what we'll do here is uh, I'll put a signal, look at it on the scope, and trigger on that and then put that signal through the coupler into the device under test. And I'm going to put various loads uh, at that device under test and we'll see the effect of the reflected signal coming back. So here's the setup. There's my signal generator over here that puts a signal into this splitter. Uh, one side of the splitter is coming out and going into channel one of the scope. 
the other side of the splitter is going into the directional coupler and then the output of the coupler is going into this little board here that it will allow me to throw a couple of different components in to ver simulate various loads the output of that is going into channel 3 we could use that to look at transmission properties and then the coupled port is going to basically read signals that are reflected back off of this port and back in this direction they'll be coupled to this uh, coupled port and they'll go into channel 2 We've got a 10 megahertz signal being applied uh, essentially to the input of our device under test here. This device under test just has a short going from the input to the output, so effectively it's just a through. Now, of course there's parasitics associated with this fixture, so it's not perfect. But what we can see on the scope is channel 1 being the yellow trace and uh, channel 3 being kind of the purple colored trace or pink trace. And we can see they essentially match. There's a little bit of a difference there, but again, that's due to the parasitics of the device and the fact that we're going through a directional coupler, which isn't perfect either. Now in this case, since the, this device is essentially through and we're just looking at the 50 ohm input impedance of the scope, that means that the input impedance to this board should be uh, pretty close to a perfect match. And if we turn on channel 2, which is looking at the coupled port, we can see that there's virtually no signal present uh, on the coupled port, which means that there's no signal being reflected off of this input port. Now, of course, if I pull this short out of my board, uh, effectively our device under test will be an open circuit. And once I do that, we can see that channel 3 has gone to nothing, right? Because there's nothing going through our board right now. So the input impedance to this device is essentially an open circuit, which means that all of the signal that's hitting the input here is being reflected back. And now we can see on the blue trace that we've got our signal reflecting back off of the input. Now, of course, you'll see the voltage scales here are different. That's because the directional coupler has got uh, some loss associated with it. The coupled port is, is several dB down from the actual signals being reflected back. But we're just going to use it to make some relative measurements here. So here we can see that the reflected signal coming back off of this port is in phase with the input signal because we don't have any reactive components here. It just is a pure open circuit. Now if I simply place a uh, light capacitive load from uh, the input to ground on my device port, we can see now that the reflected signal has changed in magnitude a little bit, but it's also gotten a phase shift associated with it. So the input reactance is causing that phase shift. If I take uh, my capacitor out and let's throw a light inductive load in our device, we can see that uh, the impedances have changed, the amplitudes have changed, and then the phase shift is now in the opposite direction. So we can see we went from a capacitive load to an inductive load. We can see that phase shift going in different directions, and we can see the changes in magnitude. Now one of the other important things that a vector network analyzer does is we'll measure very accurately the input signal and this reflected signal. There's actually a directional coupler inside the device. And by carefully measuring the amplitude and phase, or magnitude and phase, of the input signal and the magnitude and phase of the reflected signal, we can then compute many different input-related or reflection properties of the device under test. Now, so the job of the VNA is to supply the input signal to the device under test, measure the input, reflected, and transmitted signals of the device versus frequency. The magnitude and phase of the reflected and transmitted signals are then compared to and calculated against the input signal to compute various parameters. Now, of course, one thing that's very important with VNAs is calibration, because with the directional couplers and the different connections that we have to make, uh, there are many different corrections that have to be applied and calibrations that have to be applied to extract out the effects of the, the couplers and things like that. Now from the reflection measurements, there are several parameters that are typically computed and plotted on a VNA. One is the reflection coefficient, or gamma. It's a complex value. The magnitude of that is also called rho. Those are the reflection coefficients. Uh, when expressed as an S parameter, it's typically something like S11, would been referred to essentially the input of a device, or maybe S22, when referred to, say, the output reflection uh, of the device. Uh, that's essentially the ratio of the reflected signal to the input signal. Now, we can also compute and display the return loss. Return loss is kind of like the inverse of reflection coefficient. It's a ratio of the input signal to the return signal. 
Another parameter we can measure is the input impedance. You know, by knowing the magnitude and phase shift of the reflected signal compared to the input signal, we know what the complex impedance is of the device, or we can comp compute the complex admittance of the device. Now another parameter that can be computed from this, because everything is all mathematically related here, is the voltage standing wave ratio, or VSWR. This is typically very common to look at when we're uh, dealing with antennas and things like that. A helpful video that might be worth looking at, I'll, I'll link down below, is a video that I talked about uh, on transmission lines and terminations and reflections. And that might help you better understand some of these parameters, particularly SWR. Now from the transmission measurements, we're typically measuring the gain or loss of the device under test. That will give rise to a measurement of something called the transmission coefficient, which again is a complex value, and is also an S parameter is called S21, uh, which is essentially the output at port 2 in response to an input signal applied to port 1. We might also measure the insertion phase, or how much phase shift occurs through the device under test. Maybe another parameter called group delay. Group delay is essentially a measure of delay through the device, effectively across frequency. Now, for each of these measurements, uh, you typically need a two-port uh, VNA, so you can apply the input stimulus to one port and measure the transmission you know, through the device on a second port. Now, of course, there's a wide variety of vector network analyzers available on the market. Most professional-grade VNAs are two-port devices, meaning that they have two RF ports, and are also known as two-path devices. What that means is you can hook up a device, input and output to the two ports, and measure reflection off of either port and transmission in each direction without having to disconnect and reverse the device. Most VNAs have got a frequency range of a couple of gigahertz, uh, but they're available in frequency ranges up to even terahertz in frequency range. Of course, that costs some big bucks. The dynamic range, meaning you know, how deep of a notch and things like return loss and things like that you can you measure uh, is typically 120 dB or sometimes much much better than that and there's many different sweep types some can sweep power to look at uh, like compression characteristics of amplifiers and things like that so lots of different things that can be done with uh, sweeps on the professional grade devices uh, the most expensive devices are typically the benchtop devices which are standalone instruments with uh, two or more ports on them but there's also some, for the more budget conscious, more compact, or even USB driven uh, VNAs as well that have got performance that comes close to uh, the benchtop instruments or sometimes equaling them, but typically in a lower cost because all of the processing and display is all handled maybe by an external PC as opposed to being built into the instrument itself. We're starting to see the appearance of many hobbyist grade vector network analyzer devices on the market typically characterized by having maybe a lower dynamic range, a lower frequency range, maybe some limited features, feature capability, such as maybe a fewer number of measurement points or a fewer number of actual different types of measurements that can be made and trace types that are available. And they're typically geared towards specific uses, maybe amateur radio use or characterizing just an antenna or something like that but they're generally going to be limited in some way compared to the professional grade units. But it really is surprising what you can get uh, these days in some of the hobbyist grade instruments. Now here's an example of a professional grade, compact, relatively low cost, USB based vector network analyzer. Two port, two path device, covers up to about 6 gigahertz and costs in the neighborhood of $10,000 or a little bit less. Now in the world of professional grade VNAs that's actually relatively inexpensive. Of course, there's no display on here. This device is uh, driven over USB, and the user interface is actually running on the PC. So it's uh, very flexible in terms of you know, the number of traces and the way you configure channels and the, the various measurements that can be made simultaneously, and very typical of what you'd get from a professional USB-based VNA. First, now here's an example of an antenna analyzer, this uh, Rig Expert AA55 Zoom, uh, that I could also classify as a single port vector network analyzer because in addition to measuring just plain old SWR like on an SWR meter you can also measure and you know building an SWR chart over a given frequency range for example it can also measure vector properties meaning magnitude and phase so it can plot things like the complex impedance on a Smith chart for example it can uh, it can actually give you uh, 
essentially measurements of magnitude uh, and phase of the load impedance that's presented at its single port. So it's essentially a single port vector network analyzer. Now here's an example of a very low cost hobbyist grade true vector network analyzer. This is a two port one path VNA meaning it can measure reflection properties on one port and transition properties from one to the other but it can't measure uh, reflection properties off the second port and transmission in the opposite direction. But that's okay. For you know about $60, it's pretty amazing what you can do. This uh, unit will cover up to about 1.5 gigahertz and measure a complex impedance on a Smith chart, measure the magnitude and phase of reflection coefficient, uh, can measure SWR, could even do distance to fault measurements and things like that. So pretty amazing what you can do uh, with a very, very low cost device like this. Now in future videos, we'll take a look at you know, how you use a VNA, some of the measurement applications that you might uh, use it for, and we'll do some comparisons in the future between these very low-cost devices like this and what you might get with a professional device in comparison. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, little look at what a VNA is and a couple of examples of what they look like. Remember, always check uh, the video notes down below this video. There should be a PDF copy of the notes that I used here, as well as other links to other videos that you might find helpful. I'll, I'll include a link to my introduction to Smith charts. I'll also include the link to the directional coupler that I mentioned earlier. And of course, if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. And if you have subscribed, be sure to ring the little bell that's down in the lower right corner below the video so you can get notified each time I upload a new video. Thanks again as always for watching, and we'll see you next time.